Cool, yeah, it's been a long day. I'm sure everyone wants to stretch, feeling really stiff myself. But um, all right, we're going to do this last little talk. Um, uh, I'm not really going to show any work right now. I think a bunch of you guys were at the live cinema thing last night, which was really beautiful. So thanks again to Casper for organizing that and Virla. Um, I'm just going to try to talk about um, like some principles that I've learned over the years of working with um, code and stories in different ways. Um, and then just try to give you some maybe some insights or lessons that might be helpful. Uh, so this, this is a quote that comes from uh, the movie I'm Not There. I don't know if any of you guys have seen that. It's a movie about Bob Dylan that doesn't actually use his name, but represents him by uh, six different characters, uh, including like an old man, a woman, uh, and a young black kid is one of the characters. And the young black kid is supposed to represent like the Woody Guthrie archetype. Woody Guthrie is an old American folk singer. And in the scene in the movie, this kid has been taken in by a rich uh, southern family who he's performing music for. He's maybe like seven years old and he's been riding trains and he's traveling around with his guitar and he's singing old folk songs for the family and he's doing a really good job of it. But then the mother of the family kind of comes over to him and uh, puts, his, puts her arm around him and pulls him to the side of the room and she says, uh, they're good songs, kid, but you got to sing about your own time. And, uh, and then he goes on to, of course, write these like generation-defining songs about his own time. And I think in a way, like that's kind of what we're all trying to do it, by choosing this medium that we're choosing, as opposed to writing novels or writing operas or even making normal films. I think we're trying to make work that really speaks to the time we're living in, which is a kind of crazy, chaotic, um, technology-infused moment. Uh, and I think that's why a lot of this work is really messy and doesn't have the polish that other mediums have, uh, but it's also really exciting. So um, that's just like the way that I've thought about this uh, over time, certainly in my own life, and how my work's evolved over the time. So I want to really quickly run you through like a brief chronology of stuff I've made without actually showing anything, just some pictures, and then I'll, I'll get to talking about more like big picture stuff. Um, so I actually started off as a painter. I don't know if some of you guys know this, but when I was a teenager, I um, did lots of oil paintings, and I started keeping these really uh, elaborate sketchbooks. I was inspired by a guy named Peter Beard, who um, kept these crazy sketchbooks of his time in Africa, uh, filled with like drawings made in his own blood and things like that. And I started keeping these books filled with like dead insects and plants and ticket stubs and watercolor paintings and writings. And I would try to add to them um, pretty much every day. I tried to add another page. And they were kind of like this living memento of my, of my experiences that I was having. Um, some of them were really personal, others were more like just documenting stuff that was happening. Uh, and I kept these for about four, four and a half years or so, and um, I stopped keeping them really abruptly in 2003. I was traveling in uh, Central America, and I was walking down the street in the middle of the afternoon one day, and um, five people ran up behind me and uh, like grabbed me and put a gun up to my head and uh, cut my bag stop with a knife and beat me up pretty badly. And um, in the bag that was stolen, uh, there were a number of things, including a sketchbook that had about nine months of work in it. Um, and when that happened, it really kind of knocked the wind out of my sails and made me rethink um, the medium I was using. Uh, I had been doing all this stuff on paper, but I had also been studying computer science in college, but I hadn't found a way to use that stuff to make anything interesting yet. So after the robbery, I decided to stop painting and, um, and turn to code and start working with data. Uh, and so that's what I spent about 10 years doing. Um, I made a bunch of these projects in my early 20s that were trying to take static data sets and bring them to life somehow. This was the first one I made called Word Count, which was a data viz project of the 88,000 most frequently used English words. It's a really long sentence that you can navigate through. Um, I did another early one in 2004 called 10 by 10, which tried to create these automatically constructed news grids every hour based on what was happening in the global media coverage. Uh, a, a similar one to that was Universe, which also looked at global news, but uh, tried to use it to suggest new constellations for the night sky based on uh, the major themes of today. I mean, like one absurdly pretentious project after another. <laughs> uh, that was kind of the phase I was in back then. Um, and these all had like really bombastic artist statements accompanying them. If you go look at the websites, they're kind of like shocking to read now, but you know, young and brash. Um, and then uh, I did this uh, project I showed last night, We Feel Fine, which was like a search engine for feelings, and this one got a lot of attention and um, caused me to get commissioned by MoMA in New York to do a piece about online dating, which was this one called I Want You to Want Me. It was a big touchscreen installation. 
Um, and I kind of like pumped out these projects with uh, crazy speed. I was just like a maniac in those years, just working all the time, like burning through projects, burning through relationships, um, just really ambitious. And um, I don't know, I think I had this belief back then that data could tell you anything you would ever need to know about life. Um, you know, it was like, give me a laptop and an internet connection and I'll, I'll tell you anything you want to know about being a human being. And <laughs> like, that's another thing I just really don't believe anymore. Um, but, uh, I was kind of so enamored with this whole data thing, I think a little bit before the rest of the world got so into data. Um, but after doing this project for MoMA, I think I, I just started to get really burned out on data, a little bit depressed too. I, what happened was, you know, I was doing all these projects that, um, that seemed like they would be giving me these really interesting insights about human nature and human relationships and love and emotions and things. But then I found that in my actual real life relationships, I wasn't any wiser than I was before making these projects. So they were good for like pithy, witty things to say at cocktail parties, but not actually very good for becoming a better person. Um, so I decided to change it up and uh, start turning to, to more traditional documentary, but of course with the technological spin to it. Um, so I started doing projects where instead of using a computer to gather data, I would gather d the data myself following really specific rules. Uh, I did this one called the whale hunt, which was up in Barrow, Alaska, uh, taking a photograph once every five minutes for 10 days, and then more frequently when my heartbeat got fast, uh, and then built this interactive interface to display it. Uh, did a st another one in Bhutan about happiness, which is a th big thing down there. They have this thing called gross national happiness, so I would ask people to rate their happiness between one and 10 and give them that number of balloons. So you have like really happy people holding 10 balloons and really sad people holding one balloon um, and ask them all these different questions. Um, then I did I Love Your Work, which I showed last night, which was about the, the everyday lives of uh, nine different women while they were producing a, a lesbian porn series in New York. Um, and with those documentary projects, I was trying to do this thing where I would like identify things in my life that I felt I was lacking in. Um, so specifically with the whale hunt, I felt like I was lacking in like, uh, I don't know how to say it, like masculinity maybe. <laughs> I'd spent so much time just sitting behind screens and I wanted to get out into the world more and be more alive and do more bold stuff. And so I thought doing this whale hunt would help me do that. Uh, and then with the Bhutan thing, I felt like I had all these kind of smart, clever insights about data and things, but I wasn't actually very, very wise. And, um, and so I thought maybe going and talking to monks and people like this would help. Uh, and then with the porn thing, I was really like brought up to not really talk about sex ever. And I thought that just throwing myself into a world of people who do that for a living would be really interesting. So it was kind of using projects as a kind of medicine to become uh, more like the person I wanted to become, which I think is a really interesting way of thinking about what you choose to work on because um, you, you only have so much time in your life and in a human lifetime you only have a certain number of, you know, one year chunks. If a project takes you a year to make, like you only have a certain number of one year chunks in your lifetime and I think you should choose them really wisely what you end up working on with those years. Um, and so that's very much how I think about choosing what to make. Um, after doing those documentary projects, I um, started to feel like I was just a voyeur the whole time, like looking at other people's lives, and I thought it would be good to look at my own life a little bit. And so when I turned 30, I started this project of taking a photo every day and writing a story every day and putting them on my website before going to sleep. Uh, and um, I'm just going to show you a few of the pictures from it and um, tell you a couple of the stories really quickly to give you a sense of it. Um, this was one of the first ones I posted about a week after starting the project. I moved out of Brooklyn and moved up to um, uh, my old home in Vermont where my mom lives and I was weeding out my childhood bedroom. I threw out about 18 garbage bags of stuff and one of the last things to go was this picture that I had hanging on my wall for, for 10 years and it was a picture I took of my college girlfriend, Quinn, um, who was the first person I was ever really in love with and it was a picture of her loading film into a camera and I thought that you know now that she's married and has kids and lives in California, it was probably a good time to take her picture down off my wall. Um, and so, uh, so I took it down and I kind of removed the frame and, um, and I peeled back the photo from the paper where it had been hung and I kind of like gasped a little bit when I saw that the sunlight had actually stained a ghosted copy of the image into the paper where it was hanging. Um, and I kind of like dropped it on the bed and thought, you know, like some, like some things are easier to erase than other things. Um, but I threw, I threw that away. I, I, I took it off the wall, but it's in a, a shoebox now. Um, 
I headed west from there out to Oregon, and um, I, when I was in the badlands of South Dakota, I was driving down these weird roads, and I saw a little wooden sign with a road called uh, Quinn Road, which was her, that girl's name. And so I drove down the road, and there's this long grass, and um, all of these grasshoppers were coming up out of the grass and hitting the, roof, the windshield of the car and bouncing off the glass, like hundreds of them. It was very crazy. And at one point, these two grasshoppers just stayed on the glass, kind of frozen against the sky, and it seemed like some kind of, uh, you know, like alien premonition or something from some other civilization. Um, so I snacked, snapped this picture of them. And then about a week after that, um, I uh, met this girl out in Oregon who wanted to cut off this deer's head using a hacksaw and a pickaxe. Um, she wanted to put the head in the river and let the flesh decompose through the winter. And then she was going to retrieve it and put it on her fridge as a decoration in her kitchen. Um, so. <laughs> uh, then I, from there I moved to Iceland, and uh, this was a, I went to the swimming pool every day to swim because I, I love swimming. And they have this public service announcement in all the Icelandic bathrooms at the public swimming pools telling you which parts of your body you need to wash with soap. Uh, <laughs> and so the, the caption for this one said, wash away the animal. <laughs> uh, this is my sister's dog. It's, this caption for this said, find your feet. Keep it together. This is a guy in front of a smashed bus stop in Columbus, Ohio. Like every relationship. Split up, but still close together. After hibernation. Something to hold. Her web. Um, and you know, if, for those of you who were there last night, you know I stopped this project pretty abruptly after uh, about a year and a half. Um, it started to kind of take over my life. It began as something that made me much more aware of the world around me and made my memory much better and made my life much more interesting. But over time, as more and more people started following it, I started to feel like my life was becoming a performance for other people. And I started to feel like I was exploiting a lot of the relationships in my life for material to write about, which wasn't fair to those people. And um, basically, I just wanted some privacy back. And uh, I decided to stop it pretty abruptly. Um, and I wrote, this is one of the last posts. I was walking in Burlington, Vermont, where I was living at the time, and I passed this bar, and there was a band playing in the bar that night called uh, Events or Objects. And that was very much how I was feeling at that moment about the events in my life, that they were just becoming objects to mine for the amusement of other people. Um, so I went home, and I, I wrote this little, um, this little poem thing about this. So I'll just read it. When events begin to be objects, like for me, they've become every day then life is like fishing, not living. And contemplation becomes suffocation, acted in public and archived, while anonymous ogling spectators stand out of sight and look on, holding their breaths and not talking. So all I can hear are the voices, the voices, but never the breathing. Um, so just kind of like an intense time for me, and uh, I posted a couple more days after that, and then this was the last thing I posted. I was um, in, near the woods uh, in Vermont uh, going for a walk on one fall day, and I saw this uh, V formation of geese flying into the brush, and I, I took a picture of it, and I went home, and I counted the number of geese, and it turned out there were 30, which was the age I was when I started this project, and so I figured that would be the last image, and I just um, I sent this uh, with the text, um, uh, the subject of the email was geese mate for life, and the text was hard to see what comes next. And I sent it along with this um, brief email just uh, saying, thank you for following my daily photo project. I won't be keeping it anymore. I hope to get to know you in another context. Um, and within about an hour of sending out this email to all the people who were following it, uh, I had about 500 emails back from people. And generally, this was a project that nobody would respond to. On a good day, maybe I'd get 10 or 15 emails in response, but most days, none or one or two. And suddenly, I got this massive um, response from all of these people who had been silently following along for a year and a half. Uh, one woman in the UK told me that she had been about to kill herself, and then she started following the project, and it made her want to get up every morning to see what was going to come next. Um, that woman has gone on to be one of the biggest authors on Cowbird, which is the project I started after this, um, and all of these other people who just said it was, it was like a bright spot in their day. 
Uh, and it was amazing to me, actually, because it was such a simple thing, like all the other things I showed you briefly earlier were so complicated that took so much time. And this one was just like words and pictures. And I think it taught me that when something is done really honestly and really truly, even if it's very simple, it can have a much deeper impact with people than all the fancy apps and tablets and mobile and blah, 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 blah. Like, just do something that has a lot of heart and is simple, and that's going to connect with people and last much longer, I think. Um, at least that's a lesson I found for myself. Um, but I got really interested in why this thing happened, like why did that project resonate so much with people? And I noticed looking around me that actually this was happening all over the place, that suddenly lots and lots of people were becoming obsessed with the lives of other people. And I saw this in the obsession with reality TV, with the obsession with celebrity culture, with the obsession with social media and people looking at other people's Facebooks and Instagrams and all this stuff. Um, and this was happening all over the place, like people suddenly being obsessed with other people. Um, and uh, I think technology has unlocked that desire and that desire always existed, but I think that there's something else going on there also. And I think one of the reasons might be that, you know, over the last 25 years or so, you've seen this dynamic happen, which is that, uh, like, science and data has emerged as the predominant belief system of humans all over the world, at least in the West. And at the same time, you've seen this decline of religion, where generally people are abandoning the church, whatever their church is, uh, and not believing in that stuff anymore. Um, and, you know, we're kind of in this golden age of science and data right now, and extreme rationality, and this is definitely exemplified in the tech world. Um, but what has happened is that a void has opened up in between those two things. And that void has to do with learning how to actually live your life, which is something that religion historically for thousands of years has helped humans do. Religions have helped people learn how to behave, how to behave in different types of situations, how to age, how to marry, how to deal with death, how to be a parent, how to treat your elders. All of these things are things that are taught in every religion. But science has never claimed to have any kind of moral authority on teaching people how to behave. It just, just the facts, please, you know? Um, and so people are kind of groping around looking for some guidance on how to behave. And so you see the explosion of self-help and all of these other things I mentioned a second ago. Um, but I think the most interesting thing happening there in that void is this idea of personal testimony, the idea that we are all becoming like the authors of religions in a way. Like as we document our lives through Facebook and through Instagram and through our blogs and through our projects that we create, we are creating a new kind of testimony, almost like a secular gospel that other people are reading and absorbing and that's changing how they choose to live their lives. So it's like the, uh, the decentralization of, of um, morality, I think, uh, which is a very interesting thing. Um, and so you have this kind of secular gospel that's been emerging. Um, um, and this is most seen in storytelling, I think. Uh, and that's actually what the original Gospels were. Like, if you look at the Bible, those were all different personal stories from uh, the different apostles. Uh, and this is like we're all kind of doing this in a weird way now with our, with our social media stuff. So this kind of led me to want to create uh, Cowbird, which is a storytelling community that um, people can use to post uh, experiences about their life, which then get intersected and networked with other people's experiences of their lives. And I'm just going to show you three stories from Cowbird that I, that I think are really beautiful and that I think speak to this kind of secular gospel thing. Um, the first one is uh, this one. Um, this is written by a, a woman in California called Jillian. Uh, she's actually a friend of mine. And um, this is a, a photo that Jillian took of her sister, Cecily. And her sister, Cecily, actually uh, committed suicide when Jillian was in college. Um, she uh, killed herself in their parents' home in California using a kitchen knife uh, right in front of the stove in the kitchen. And uh, her dad woke up, heard the noise, walked into the kitchen, and saw her his daughter um, on the ground. And, uh, and this is the story that uh, Jillian posted on the 10th anniversary of that happening. It's called, uh, It's Cecily, Darling. My sister passed away 10 years ago today. I can still hear my dad's voice at the other end of the line. It's Cecily, Darling. She died in the middle of a clear, cold night, the stars twinkling up above her through the skylight. I was 3,000 miles away. Here she is, looking straight into me, as if my camera was never there. As if it was just the two of us, the sky, the ocean, and the sand. I often wonder what it would be like to see her again. The pain of the loss is so unbearable, I would probably fall to the floor. But really, 
I would want to wrap my arms around her and tell her I missed her so. I look at this photograph when I want to see her again because at least with this, I can see her there. I wonder how many miles apart we are right now. I love you, Cess. Cecily, darling. Um, so uh, this is a very different one. This is um, by a photographer named Aaron Huey who um, has a young kid named Hawkeye who's five. And they have a little family tradition that they do every time that they are on a road trip and see a rainbow. And um, this is an audio story, so I'll just turn up the sound. Rainbow. That's just rainbow. Rainbow. What's the sound you make when you see a rainbow? just like a little moment from, from something really personal and shared. Um, and this is the last one I'm going to show. This is uh, uh, posted by a woman in Norway. Um, and uh, it's about her, um, her son. It's called Feel It. We were on a cruise ship from Finland to Sweden. We watched as the ship came closer to land. Me with my camera in hand as usual. Then I saw he was sad all of a sudden. Are you upset about something, Folke? Yes. I want you to stop taking pictures and stand with me and feel the wind instead. And so that's what I did. Um. <clears throat> OK, so I, I, I just want to kind of uh, give some bigger picture thoughts on some of this stuff. Um, uh, first, I just want to say a couple things about like languages, and uh, you know we think of languages as things like English and uh, French and um, and Dutch and Chinese, but actually languages are much more diverse than that. There are things like dance and cinema and painting and calligraphy and pottery and code. All of these things are languages that can be used to say different things, um, and I think one thing that uh, is dangerous about languages, especially new languages, and especially new languages that are evolving very quickly with new features being added to them, such as the case with technology and software, is that you can get so caught up in learning the language and staying up to date with the new syntax of the language that you can forget the, more, the much more important and more difficult question, which is, what are you going to use that language to say? Uh, and there comes the point in the learning of any language where you have to say, OK, I know enough of this language, and now I'm going to turn to the task of figuring out what I'm going to say with this language. And that's a harder question. So that's just something to keep in mind when you maybe feel yourself getting swept away with the latest version of the software and the latest thing and the latest tech thing. Like, remember that uh, what you're saying with the language is actually more important than how you're saying it, although, although both are important. Um, and I just want to return briefly to this idea of the secular gospel and how that relates to what we're all doing. I mean, if, if, you, if you take my premise that uh, social media and online self-expression is like a new kind of secular gospel that everybody is creating, then I think one way to think about interactive documentaries and these really beautiful, like, bespoke experiences that people in this room are making is to think about them as like the illuminated manuscripts of that secular gospel. So it's not just the raw text, but it's the parts of that text that are so important to communicate that you're going to actually spend a huge amount of time making them into the most beautiful thing you can make them, uh, which will last for a really long time. So if you think about your work as creating illuminated manuscripts, like what will you choose to illuminate? Um, I want to say a few things about good interfaces, my opinions about what makes an interface good, what makes a design good. Uh, and this is very useful, especially when you're thinking of um, taking a given story that you might have and thinking how to bring it to life in an interface. So. A few principles. The first is that uh, you can't make something beautiful. You can only show that something already is beautiful. 
And um, I think this is a very, very common mistake in the world of data art and interactive documentary and all of this stuff, which is that people take something that's actually not very interesting to begin with and think that just by adding a fancy interface and good design to it, that somehow it will magically become interesting. This is a lot like taking a really, really boring person and dressing them up in good fashion and makeup and stuff, but when you get around to talking to them, they're still like kind of boring. Um, and so I think you should ask yourself when you're choosing what to work on, like make sure that the data you're using or the story you're using is a really beautiful, compelling thing to start with and then any kind of interface or design you add on top of that will just be like gravy it'll just make it even better um, but if you start with something that's not very compelling it's an almost impossible battle and it's going to be really hard to make it interesting um, Another thing about good interfaces is that they're, they're instantly knowable and infinitely masterable and good examples of this principle are the piano and the pencil uh, these are both things that a little five-year-old kid can take up and start playing with and immediately get feedback, but which you can spend your entire lifetime trying to master and never completely master. And so good interfaces have this quality where they give you instant feedback and are instantly knowable, but they have a huge amount of depth and you can become a master of them over time. Uh, I think good interfaces are, are playful. They're fun to use. Uh, they react to... Uh, to you when you touch them, when you, when you poke them, when you prod them, they, they react. Uh, and they're also self-consistent. And I think this last bit is really important. When you're designing something, it should be consistent with itself. In other words, uh, all of the different parts of it should relate to all of the other different parts of it. And when you're looking at something that has that trait, it feels like it's something that's well understood by its creator. When somebody understands something well, that means it's usually something that's very self-consistent. Uh, so it's a good signal to when you're evaluating a work, like how self-consistent is this thing? Uh, and I think living organisms are that way. Uh, good interfaces have emergent, not decorative aesthetics. And what I mean by this is that good interfaces should emerge from the type of thing that they are containing. So an uh, interface for a story about um, a war in Bosnia should be very different from an interface about uh, bees or, um, or any other thing. Like the way you express something visually should relate to the thing that you're expressing. Uh, so the, the interface should emerge from the thing. Um, uh, I think good interfaces also do this thing where they allow you to shift scales between really small stuff and really big stuff and provide bridges between the two. This is a new thing that technology can do. Like uh, in the past, we had uh, the big stuff, like you had bar charts in The Economist magazine, and then you had the small stuff, like a story on This American Life, but there was no way to connect these two things. But now we can actually do that. We can take the bar chart and explode it into all of the little individual data points and stories that led to that bar chart height. And in the same way, you can take an individual story and zoom out and see it in statistical context. So I think that's something that good interfaces often do. Uh, they also deliver the experience of discovery. They don't just tell you the finding. They don't just tell you the result. But they deliver that eureka moment that, um, that, uh, that usually means you'll remember the thing. Sometimes when you, people just tell you a principle, uh, you won't really remember it. But when they tell you the story of how they came to hold that principle, then it really sticks with you. So I think they deliver this experience of, of having that moment of discovery. Uh, and then finally, I think good interfaces have this quality of being both windows and mirrors. And what I mean by that is that they provide windows into things you wouldn't normally get to see. So you have this kind of delicious voyeurism to it. But then at the same time, they're mirrors, and you see yourself in the thing. And uh, that seeing yourself is really important because that's, that's the source of empathy. And when you have empathy, then people relate much more deeply to the thing. So if you can make something a mirror where people see themselves in it, uh, that'll make it much more resonant, I think. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is just uh, a few things about good projects, like how you choose what to work on. There's obviously an infinite number of stories out there in the world. There's an infinite number of ways you can spend your time. But as I said earlier, there's only a certain number of one-year chunks you're going to have in your lifetime. And I think it's important to use them really carefully. Um, so the first thing I would say, this is an idea from Zen philosophy, which is, uh, if so, so what? <laughs> so if, if you have this idea for something, and if you make it, and if it is suddenly existing in the world, so what? Um, did it have a good impact? Did it bring you more joy? Did it make you grow as a person somehow? Um, so this is a simple question, but uh, not just thinking about things that you can do, but, but why are you doing them? And what, what impact do you imagine they'll have? What outcome do you imagine they'll have? Uh, this is another quote. This is uh, from an American composer named Nico Muley, who I like a lot. He's a young composer. And he was um, having a conversation in a bar in Iceland with um, Jonsi from Sigur Rós. Uh, and they were talking about how they decide what kind of music to make. And one thing Nico Muley said, he said, every time I'm considering making a new piece of music, I ask myself, is this music preferable to silence? 
uh, and if it's not preferable to silence, I, I, won't, I won't release it, I won't make it. Uh, and so this is an interesting um, yardstick to use for your projects. Are they preferable to silence? <laughs> Um, is the thing you're making not just timely, but also timeless? I think this is a really important question for people working with new technology, where there's such a temptation to use the latest app or the latest uh, technology device or whatever it is, uh, and to make something very timely so it gets a lot of media coverage and attention, but then maybe five years from now it just looks incredibly dated and out of touch and boring. Uh, and that's fine to make work that way, but personally I prefer things that have this timeless quality where they only get more beautiful with time. Uh, and if you can do something that's both timely and timeless, that's obviously the best. Uh, this, this last one I also think is really important. Um, it's very easy to be a critic and to describe things that suck. Obviously, there's a lot of problems in the world right now. There's a lot of like uh, humans being really nasty to other humans. There's a lot of people having a really hard time with life. There's a lot to complain about. There's a lot to hate about the modern world. Um, but it's so easy to just criticize things. I think what you have to do as an artist is you have to criticize things and make people see those things, but then offer people a way out. Show how people are preserving their humanity in the midst of all that show how people are still living beautiful lives even in the midst of all of the crap. Uh, and I think this quality of offering people a way out, articulating a more beautiful world, this is a really important thing for artists to do, I think, because uh, artists are like, they're like the healers and the, the doctors for, for people's spirits. Um, and if artists are only pointing out what's wrong, uh, then people still have the task of figuring out what to do about it. Um, and then uh, the last one is, uh, does your project help you become the person you want to be? Um, I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier about trying to choose things that steer my life in certain directions, but I think this is a really useful way of, of thinking about your work. Um, if you have a sense of who you want to be 10 years from now or 50 years from now, does this project get you like one step closer to that? Uh, and I want to end with this quote by uh, Toni Morrison, an American novelist uh, who's old now. And she says, at some point in life, the world's beauty becomes enough. You don't need to photograph, paint, or even remember it. It is enough. And um, when I see this, I feel like I'm um, like, I feel like a future version of myself will maybe write that or agree with that. Um, I think it's true. It's one of those things that when I hear it, it feels true. But um, I also feel I'm not quite at that point yet, and I still want to keep making stuff and <laughs> recording stuff. Um, but I think uh, it's also going to be really nice someday to reach that point. So I'm looking forward to that, too. <laughs> so um, that's all I'm going to say. So thank you guys a lot for listening. Yeah, this is good. Thank you, Jonathan. Sure. Yeah. Extremely interesting, I think. And I think this, this point of, of, of reaching you know, a certain day or a certain point with which everything is enough, you just move that a lot forward for me because that was very, very interesting and very inspiring. Uh, we have time for one or two questions, if anybody wants to ask uh, Jonathan anything. Or maybe you want to leave it for the bar. Anyone with a question? Otherwise, we'll wrap it up here. I think there's one. There's uh, one question? There's one out there. Yeah. What's next? Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I've, I've been in kind of a, a bit of a like stuck phase for the last few months. Um, I've actually been writing an essay about like being stuck and how that feels and different points in my life when I've been <laughs> stuck, uh, which should be done pretty soon. Um, and that's been cathartic. Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, I've, I've definitely reached the point of feeling pretty burned out on technology and was feeling pretty committed to do something not involving technology next. Um, but it's also something that I know really well and I've used for many years and it's scary to try to do something that doesn't use it at all. Um, so I'm, I'm act the honest answer is I'm not really sure right now. Um, I have a lot of ideas, but nothing that's like really grabbed me yet. Yeah. One more uh, question? Yeah, one more. Yeah, mostly independently. I, if you saw that slide with everybody's names, I think, um, I think me and Kat Katrina were the only two people that uh, had no like turquoise affiliations under our names. <laughs> um, yeah, I've just been making stuff on my own, and um, I've done a couple collaborations with a close friend of mine named Sep Kambar, who teaches at MIT now, um, more on like the data projects from, from when I was a bit younger. Um, but recently, I've been mainly working on my own. Um, yeah. 
uh, yeah, and I su I've been supporting myself mainly through a uh, combination of like grants and giving talks and doing commissions. Um, but it's actually really hard, especially in the U.S. I mean, there's very little funding for uh, this kind of stuff, um, unless you're going to do work with an ad agency or work within Google or work within Facebook or something like that. Uh, there's not a lot of like public funding for for digital art or any art, uh, so people kind of have to hustle and figure it out on their own. Um, it's, Different, different landscape over there. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very guys. much, Jonathan. Appreciate it.